Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. We're really excited to uh, present some excerpts from Intimate Apparel and do a little discussion about how the piece came together. Um, I, in addition to uh, running the Opera Commission program at the Met, I oversee a program that's a co-venture between the Met and Lincoln Center Theater called the Met Lincoln Center Theater New Works Program, and it's dedicated to developing new works through a workshop format, and Intimate Apparel was one of the pieces that started in that program, so I'm particularly excited about it getting to this point. Um, I'd like to introduce the creative team, and then we'll go on to a little discussion. Uh, Lynn will give a synopsis of the piece, and we'll have some excerpts. So, Composer Ricky Ian Gordon uh, has created a distinguished body of work which includes songs, music, theater, and opera. His song settings, texts from a wide range of poets have been sung by everyone from Renee Fleming to Audra McDonald to Judy Collins. His music theater pieces include Sycamore Trees, My Life with Albertine, and his operatic works include Ellen West, which recently was performed in New York at the Prototype Festival. Uh, Morning Star, 27, A Coffin in Egypt, Orpheus and Eurydice, and The Grapes of Wrath. So he's, he's done a lot. He's won an Obie Award, the Helen Hayes Award, the Richard Rogers Award, and the Stephen Sondheim Award. So that's Ricky Ian Gordon. <laughs> Librettist Lynn Nottage is a two-time Pulitzer Prize winner for her plays... For her plays Sweat and Ruined, she's won an Obie Award, the Susan Smith Blackburn Prize, she's been nominated for a Tony Award, many other awards, and her other plays include Malima's Tale, uh, By the Way, Meet Vera Stark, Fabulation, uh, and Crumbs for the Table of Joy. She wrote the books for the musicals The Secret Life of Bees and the upcoming Michael Jackson Broadway musical MJ. She's the recipient of MacArthur Genius Grant, fellowship and she has her own film production company and is a writer producer on the Netflix series She's Gotta Have It. <laughs> Our Tony winning director Bartlett Scher is the, the resident director of Lincoln Center Theater where he has directed South Pacific, My Fair Lady, Oslo, The King and I, Golden Boy, Joe Turner's Come and Gone, Awake and Sing and The Light in the Piazza. He's also had recent productions of Fiddler on the Roof, and his hit production of To Kill a Mockingbird is running, uh, enjoying a long run on Broadway right now. Uh, his opera productions include Romeo and Juliet, Two Boys, The Barber of Seville, Otello, uh, Tales of Hoffman, uh, L'Elysir de More, all of those at the Met, and others uh, at other houses too, including Faust and Rigoletto. His productions have been seen in opera houses in Salzburg, Milan, Berlin, Chicago, London, and Baden-Baden. So, our chair. Uh, before we begin the musical ex excerpts, I'm going to turn it over to Lynn Nottage, who will give a synopsis of Intimate Apparel, and then we can move on from there. Um, thank you, Paul. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's really lovely to be here. I, I thought I'd just give a brief synopsis of the play Intimate Apparel and the opera. Um, it is 1905. We meet Esther who's a gifted but lonely seamstress who lives in Mrs. Dixon's boarding house for women. She makes beautiful corsets and undergarments for clients, ranging from Mrs. Van Buren, a wealthy Fifth Avenue socialite, to Mamie, who's an African-American prostitute and singer in the Tenderloin. She buys her fabric from Mr. Marks, who's an Orthodox Jewish man with whom she shares a special bond. At 35, still single and longing for her husband, she suddenly begins receiving beautiful letters from George, who's a mysterious laborer on the Panama Canal. Illiterate, Esther turns to her clients to help, writing, uh, to help write and read the letters. When George arrives in New York, he isn't the man she expected. I thought we'd move on to a few questions for the creators of the piece. And um, we'll start with Ricky Ian Gordon, the composer, and just to ask the, the very simple question, how did it all begin? It all began um, in, I got this commission from the Met and Lincoln Center Theater in like 2007 and had a whole other project that fell apart. And this is, and uh, by the way, Lynn has a story, I have a story, and you have a story, and everyone's story is different. So I'm, this is what I remember is that I thought, <laughs> I knew Lynn from the, when I won an Obie Award for Orpheus and Eurydice and she was on the committee. And I loved her when I met her. And so I thought, I'm gonna read all of her plays. And 
I read them and was completely dazzled. And in my, what I remember is that I fell in love with Intimate Apparel and I Facebooked Lynn. And I said, do you want to write an opera for The Met with me? And Lynn goes, for first she said, yeah. <laughs> but then she said, I always thought my opera, Intimate Apparel, my, that my play Intimate Apparel was an opera. And I, in my, I feel like I said, bingo. That's what I want to make an opera out of. <laughs> and then it just, it really, I mean, I love Lynn. It just sort of happened. It was Lynn's first opera libretto, and basically we worked with Paul. And really, it mostly what took time was there were three drafts of the of the play turned into a libretto, mostly because to change your well, I'll let you talk about that. But and, and just to amend one thing that you said okay. is that we corresponded on Facebook, and then we spoke for two years about what we should adapt before we decided that we wanted to do intimate apparel. But secretly, both of us wanted to do that, and we never revealed it to each other. Oh. So that's... Right, we talked about a new piece, we, maybe. We talked about new piece, we read different yeah. things. I'm, I've lost a lot of brain cells somewhere. <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> well, Lynn, what, for you, what was the process like of adapting a play that's been very much produced, a huge success all over the country, um, had a great run in New York with Viola Davis originally, so to take this beloved play and turn it into an opera, what did um, that You take? know, it's an interesting proce process because it is a play that I love very much. It was a play that I wrote just after my mother died, and I poured all of my, my soul and my my emotions into it and so I thought it was going to be very difficult to revisit it but it wasn't because in some ways I feel like its perfect form is an opera. Um, but I'm very new to this whole librettist game and there was a huge learning curve when I first when I delivered the very first libretto to um, Ricky and I think it was the same length as the play. He's like, oh my God, if we actually put this to music, it will be five and a half hours. <laughs> and he said, you've simply rewritten your play. He's like, go back to the drawing board. I went back, I rewrote it, came back to him, and he said, you've still just rewritten your play. And then he said something that was really wise. He said, you're not trusting your collaborator. When you're, when you're writing an opera, the music really does more than 50% of the work, and I was still trying to lean on the language for exposition, but it's very easy for the music to, um, to, to show us what people are feeling in a very expansive way. And so once I surrendered some of the control and ceded it to Ricky, then the opera happened. It's true, and, and, and it was, but it was a beautiful process because it, it finally, the, the final libretto is like the play boiled down to a stop. And actually, enough cannot be said about Paul, who is the dramaturg for the Met. And Paul really combed through every draft with us, <laughs> so much so that at one point we were at a workshop in Cincinnati, and all of a sudden it looked like Lynn had had a heart attack. And she was like, oh my god, I left out a major beat. And it was like, we had to come back to New York and put it back in, because we were so careful yeah. about narrowing down the play. Um, you had to create for the piece, Ricky, uh, a whole musical language for, that would convey the, the time period, the place, the storylines, the different characters. How did you go about doing that? It, it started with, just to say, my father was obsessed with the movie The Sting. And um, so when I was little, I had to learn literally every Scott Joplin rag. And it was just like, I had to play all those rags. So in a way, rag lives inside of me. And I thought Lynn opens the play, um, or at least the opera, with a cakewalk. And I went to Banff in Canada, and I wrote like a 10-minute cakewalk. And I always thought that was going to be the opening of the opera. And we did our first um, reading at the Met. It was actually Bart that was like, yeah, you can't open the opera with like a 10-minute cakewalk <laughs> before anything happens. I was like, but I really like that cakewalk. Anyway, so now it's sort of, it's sewn into the fabric of the piece and then it ended up being this new opening. But um, it was, I have to say, one of the reasons that this piece I wanted to do it was I knew that this is definitely my um, wheelhouse. It's like, it's just all kinds of, Americana that I live in. You know, I was like, my mother was a singer and comedian in the Borscht Belt. I know every song by Gershwin, every song by Cole Porter. I was her pianist, and so American, this is, you know, it's 
American melting pot slash trash can in my head. And you've had a, <laughs> you've had a deep connection to African American literature and art and music all over your career, setting Langston Hughes poems totally. to music. Totally. Yes. And uh, you know, love for African American singers. So that branch of things feeds into the. Yes, it process was everything too. about it felt right to me, including, by the way, that there is a you know an Orthodox Jew character right in the. I felt like okay, I'm Mr. Marx. <laughs> Now, Bart, as far as your involvement, once we got you on board, you it all put into your lap how to turn this thing into a, a stage piece and, to, <laughs> and, and with multiple storylines, transitions, rapid transitions between scenes, going back and forth between multiple locations. How, what's that process like? Um, well, actually, the, the blessing of the project is that um, from having worked on one other new opera at the Met, um, the hardest thing about the opera, I mean, knowing that Ricky was writing the music was a great blessing. The hardest thing about the opera is a good book, as we would say in musicals. Because the, the trick is, is having good reasons to sing and enough intricate plot lines, plus this emotional core that's at the piece that is better expressed when she says she thinks it's an opera, because it's in its own way better expressed through music. So the the, it's been actually a relatively easy process for me in terms of development. I mean, we had one long meeting after I'd seen a reading where I basically said something, I'd take out all the transitions, the musical transitions, and just sort of compressed it even further. Um, but the, once that was in, in, in place, then the bigger question became, well, how do you, you know, building a machine that operates the opera. So we have a, a beautiful design from a team of people I've used at the Met a lot and Lincoln Center, and, um, a wonderful choreographer, Diane McIntyre, who I've worked with on Joe Turner. And we basically are, have this turntable machine in which the piece is constantly overlapping and kind of in layers moving back and forth that kind of, that complements the sort of depth of the score and serves up the characters for the better, the best, most beautiful utterances that they have. Also, some of it is rhymed, which is, very subtly rhymed all in, in different places by Lynn, which is extremely fun and elegant, but you probably didn't notice a single rhyme, but there are places in there where it's layered through, and that that also, that little extra lift and stylized quality um, is makes it just super fun. The use of the turntable is crucial to yeah. the transitions and keeping it moving. How does that fit into uh, the decision to stage it in the Mitzi Newhouse, which is a thrust? Uh, yeah, well, the, the, uh, we had a lot of conversations about where, where's the best place to do this and what are the best conditions for doing it, and sort of came to the conclusion that the, um, the Mitzi Newhouse, which some of you may know at Lincoln Center, is the smaller downstairs, downstairs thrust, which is 300 seats. It's not very much uh, bigger than this theater. Um, and uh, Rudolf Bing in the 70s used to use it for what he called the mini Met. And so uh, we just kind of came to a conclusion that might be really nice since this is a, a, um, a commissioning project between Lincoln Center Theater and, and the Met to try it in a different context. And by, by putting it in the context of the Mitzi and having double cast a couple of the roles, we can run it eight performances a week and also introduce new audiences to opera and sort of put this weird um, cross-pollinated uh, piece of ex theater experience into a different space. And so that, I think that kind of uh, generates a different interest for opera and a different way of bringing audiences into it. And, and that's been a lot, Peter Gelb and Andre Bishop are sort of overlords. And um, they're, they're helping us to kind of make these decisions of which could give us a different way and a different experience of getting into opera. The great thing about the Mitzi Newhouse is, as, as Bart said, it's, so, it's nearly the size of this space, so it allows the intimacy that's so important to the piece. It was a, in the, in the, is this correct, Lynn, in the play, every character, in the, every scene in the play is just a two-character scene. Yeah, the, the structure of the original play uh, um, was um, built around the boudoir, and that was kind of my art problem, is what happens if you have two, scene, um, two characters in each scene and there's a bed between them? How does that shift the way in which they communicate? And, um, and, and, and that's what I was exploring. But can I just add a, a little something about why we also chose the Mitzi Newhouse is that accessibility is really important 
to, to me, and one of the things that you feel when you go into the grand opera houses is, is, is that there isn't a lot of diversity in the audiences. And I felt I don't want to create an opera that doesn't um, speak to audiences that look like myself. And I thought it would be a lot easier in a smaller space if you have ticket prices that are affordable for people to come. We also were thinking about um, the future of the opera. If something that's lean and mean can go into non-traditional opera spaces and have a life beyond the grand operas that are very exclusionary. And also, yeah. And, and, and also, Lynn's, Lynn's worked hard with Lincoln Center to make sure that we're holding aside tickets and providing programs and opportunities for, for uh, more diverse audiences to find their way to the theater as well, because it's also a small space, so it's going to sell fast. Get your tickets, but um, <laughs> but uh, but also so that there would be opportunities to make sure those tickets are still available. Mm. And Ricky, as far as the uh, another aspect of the Mitzi Newhouse is the, in the intimacy is how that affects the decision about the musical forces. Can you talk about that? Yes. So we decided to to, to orchestrate it um, for two pianos, and it was it was because um, in a space that's small. If you try to do, it's, it's actually quite, the, the music is big and lush and a lot of times symphonic. And if you do a chamber orchestration, a chamber orchestration would make the music sound small. Whereas if you do two pianos, pianos have, they create a lot of sound and it would sound more symphonic and more authentic to what I wrote and what I heard in my, my head. There will probably eventually be another version of this opera, which is fully orchestrated with the two piano version. But I yeah, also yeah, we're doing it at La Scala, but <laughs> exactly. exactly in Italian. But the one other thing too was that um, is that is the piano, the pianos in the actual space of the piece are are the sound that they are hearing in the parlor. And it, it just feels right to have them, and they are seen. I love that the way Michael Jurgen designed the set, that the pianists are visible. Yeah, Bart, can you just talk a little bit about what it will look like? Yeah, it's a very, it's a, um, the whole space is wood. Um, I, we think that'll help the sound, but also just because it's a more period feel to it. Uh, the two pianos are elevated above the stage, actually pretty high. And then the rest of it comes uh, circulates around a single turntable. If you've been in the Mitzi, it's in the sort of the center of the thrust. And the chorus is on stage most of the time, coming and going a bit. Um, and it's uh, somewhat presentational in a way, but very simple props, uh, which move a lot and move insanely complicated way. But that's fine. And um, uh, but it's a, it's a kind of very uh, liquid. Um, transformative piece. It never sit, rests very long in any one place, except, you know, it arrives in these duets where you have these sort of scenes and then it breaks open into sort of multi-layered choruses. So it's that, pretty simple. That's another aspect of how the piece uh, evolved from the play. Um, can you, either of you talk about how you expand uh, a play that it, it began with two character scenes and now you've got a beautiful chorus to work with and ensembles? Sure, that was, uh, that was one of the really fun parts about this entire process is imagining more people on stage. Um, when I originally wrote the play, it was tight and it was intimate, and it was meant to be, as, as Bart said, these, these duets. And suddenly, um, we had the ability to have a chorus and have all this luscious sound and go outside of the boudoir. You know, we can go to the gambling hall and we can go to the streets of the Lower East Side right. and we can watch the, the maids in Mrs. Van Buren's um, Boudoir make up her room, and so that was very exciting for me. Though it, it, it destroyed a little bit of the conceit, but it was a big, it was a big change. It really. was a huge change. Yeah. 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 Like two separate, two beautiful separate. pieces. But it was it was fun. And then that, of course, gives you sorts all sorts of musical opportunities. Can yes. you talk about that? Yes, I mean it's like the the thing about Lynn, her work is it's really fun and wonderful to sit to music because, as Bart said, the spine is so strong, the characters are so strong. The story is so strong that it's, for me, it's easy to enter the hearts of the characters. And then when you have all these other voices, like Bart, what happened with, one thing that happened with the chorus is when Bart told me to pare down the, um, the transitions, we decided to make it cinematic. And I watched, it's 
there's this person, it's really wonderful to watch Bart direct in a room. And it's, it's very musical, and I started feeling like all the transitions were choral. And as Stephen Osgood, our conductor, said, it's like the orchestra, the chorus is the orchestra in this piece. Mm -hmm. And um, Bart, your other creative uh, team members, did you just want to say anything about, about them? Um, yeah, I mean, it's people uh, that I've worked with a lot. I met um, uh, Jennifer Tipton, who's one of the great lighting designers, you know, I think of all time. Um, uh, Kathy Zuber, uh, who's got more Tony nominations than anybody next to, I mean, it was and, ridiculous. And who also coincidentally designed the costumes for the original play. Yeah, the original yes. play. Which is fine. Um, and um, uh, Michael, Jurgen. Michael Jurgen, who does all the sets with me, and then Diane McIntyre for choreography. So it's a, it's a nice team. It's very focused. They, they know Lincoln Center well. Lincoln Center is a wonderful place to make anything because it's, it's, uh, so supportive and clear. I think it's also been really interesting for the cast because there are opera singers who are now working, you know, on like what we call equity contracts, <laughs> and they're all outside of their normal, um, essentially, means of production. You know, the very focused rehearsal time, you know, a two month run, eight shows a week, and full longer text. And anyone who knows working often in opera, you don't get the kind of concentrated work on a single piece for such a long period of time. So I, I've always, I love working at the Met, but it's not the easiest place in the world. I call it like paint bucket directing. You know, you're like rolling stuff under the stage. And um, it isn't really like careful brush strokes of any kind. And whereas with this, we can actually do really careful work and build up the thing with a lot of layers and depth. And that is going to be interesting to see over, and plus previews and plus things like that. It's going to be interesting to see what kind of work we can make with different conditions. Because opera often is really difficult conditions to make something with that kind of detail. Mm -hmm. And you've talked in rehearsals about the, the, those uh, layers uh, that Lynn's work and Ricky's work provide to, to work on. There's so much there to begin with that you can excavate. And you're, it's been fascinating watch, watching Bart talk about working against, you know, as you probably have noticed, Ricky's music is effusive and lyrical and gorgeous and very emotional. And you have to sort of work against that, you said, in, in rehearsal in a few Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm always sort of cutting, cutting against the edge of the music so that there's tension in the, in the playing and, and, and following the, the sort of strength of the characters um, to keep this sort of tight, tight string between where the piece is going and what it's expressing. So I think you, without making too crazy a comparison, you find the same thing in a Verdi or whatever else because they're often hugely expressive, but you have to keep moving forward. So it's how to keep that thing as tight as possible. Mm -hmm. Then I had a, just a side question for you, which is now that you've had this experience, has operatic writing for the opera affected your other writing? Because we've been you've been working on this for years now, and you've you, you, created other pieces since then. I think you, writing not just for, for opera, but in musical theater in this past year has um, taught me something about economy um, and um, approaching write, writer in a different way in terms of problem solving. Um, usually, when I'm writing my plays, I use language to dig myself out of a hole. And now I understand that I can gap action, that I can use other tools in order to tell my, my story. Though I will say that I found writing a libretto and musical theater much harder than writing plays. Wow. And it's not just about the collabor collaborative process, but because of um, um, the different way in which you have to think about how you tell your stories. Mm -hmm. 3D chess. Yeah, 3D ch chess. And also, in, in collaborating, I'm so used to, as a playwright, just going into my room by myself and solving problems. And now, um, I can't do that, you know? It's, it's like there's so many other people who are, like, inside my process. Yeah. <laughs> and it's been fun that, you know, the other person has been Ricky and, and Bart, but still, there's part of me that loves living in isolation. Yeah. <laughs> it's a big shift. Yes, it's a big shift. Yeah. And Ricky, I've, I've known Ricky since about 1995, maybe. So I've seen Ricky evolve and change and grow and do all sorts of things. I mean, back when I first met you, you really, your opera career was just maybe beginning. Yeah. And now you've got multiple operas under your belt. How do you feel that your process has changed, since this is works in process, from that period to through Intimate Apparel? Well, the, 
the big the big change happened with with the Grapes of Wrath, which premiered in 2007. Um, my style got fatter, and I had to hear more. And so then I got, you know, my technical technical stuff came into my process. Like I started working with computers, and and um, I sketch everything at the piano, and then entering things into the computer and working chorally. And I have to hear what I'm doing now a lot more. And um, but it's the 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 basic thing is that you. If you're an opera composer, you spend a lot of time, like Lim was talking about, you spend a lot of time alone. But at the end of every journey, everyone is in the room because you spent all that time alone in your room, and it's always really worth it. Thank you. And, and could I just add one thing? When Ricky and I were talking about this opera, one of the things we charge ourselves is to create something that felt like it always existed. And I feel like Ricky has succeeded. It feels very much like it's part of the American canon, you know, before it's even premiered. <laughs>